Good morning. good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you here once again, and what a beautiful day it is that we may gather together to worship our God, our Savior, our King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. We've been going over here on Sunday mornings a series of lessons of called or themed, if you will, the Beatitudes of the Bible. And up to this point, we've looked at several. We've looked at blessed are those, for example, that come forth taking refuge in God. Blessed are those who dwell in God's house. We've even looked at blessed are those who find strength in God and observe his justice or obey his law as of last week. Today, we will be examining blessed are those whose way is blameless from Psalm 119, verse 1 and 2. In Psalm 119, 1 and 2, we read this, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. As we examine this idea of being blessed or finding joy and happiness, by which God grants us through uh, our love for Him. We see something interesting in this particular beatitude, and that is the word blameless. The word blameless in English is translated 52 times as such. In other words, we find the word blameless in the ESV 52 times. In the New King James, 49 times the New American Standard 50 times. I say that to say this, it is not a word that is uncommon in the Bible. It's not a word that isn't found throughout it. As I said, over 50 times in the Bible, in both Old and New Testament, <clears throat> we see this word found. But when we think about it and when we look at it, when we ask the question about blameless, when we think of ourselves, there's more that needs to be examined. And so with that idea, let's go ahead and look at our first point, blessed are the blameless. What does blameless mean? Sometimes the word is translated and we need a little bit more information because there's more to it than what it says. And so when we look at the word blameless, what does blameless mean? When describing the expectations for God's creation in his image, you and I, you and I would be hard pressed, I would imagine, to use the word blameless concerning ourselves. When I think of the word blameless, and I think about verses like Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means I've sinned. When I think of the word blameless in light of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 and verse 10 that says, listen, if we say we have no sin, we are lying to ourselves and we're calling God a liar because we all sin. And so when I think of the word blameless, as it's typically thought of in light of Romans 3, 23 and 1 John 1, 8 and 10, I struggle with that idea. Blessed are the blameless. And yet, when you go to look up this word, in its original meaning, you see it means exactly what it says. Mounts' lexicon defines it as without defect, blameless, perfect. The Lexham analytical defines it as complete, unscathed, intact, blameless, without fault. The Dictionary of Biblical Languages says it this way, without defect, blameless, perfect. The King James and New King James translates it instead of blameless as undefiled. 
The word blameless, as you and I would typically think of it, means exactly what it says. To be perfect, to be undefiled, to be without any kind of blemish. It's the same word even used of the sacrifices that were to God. They were to be without blemish. They were to be blameless. How can you and I, who as I said sin, whether it's before we obeyed the gospel or after we've obeyed the gospel, Romans 3.23 before and 1 John 1, 8 and, 8 and 10 afterwards, how is it God can say, listen, if you want to be happy in this life, blessed in this life, you need to be blameless. How can he say that to us? How can we be undefiled? How can we be without fault, in other words? The reality is we can't do it on our own. It's only done one way, and that's through the blood of Christ. You and I cannot make ourselves blameless. It's not going to happen. There's no magic wand. There's no work we can do. There is nothing in our ability as mankind created in the image of God, even in his image, that we can do to make ourselves blameless. That's why Jesus came. Throughout the Old Testament, there's an interesting phrase that was said over and over and over by God. It wouldn't become relevant, really, in the sense of his total understanding until the New Testament, the law of Christ, but nevertheless, it was proclaimed, and that is the phrase, life is in the blood. We remember passages like Genesis 9 and verse 4, right after the flood. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Why? Life is in the blood. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, 23, right before the Jews are to take the promised land after wandering 40 years. And going over that which was often said in Leviticus and other places, uh, we see Moses reminding them, only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. And you shall not eat the life with the flesh. In the book of Leviticus, we see this more described or filled out, if you will, in Leviticus chapter 17. In Leviticus 17, starting in verse 11, we read this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore I have said to the people, <clears throat> of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Anyone also, or anyone also of the people of Israel, or the strangers who sojourn among them, who takes in hunting any beast or bird that, they may, that may be eaten, shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Notice that statement there in the first. Oops, wrong one. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given to you for, on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. When we look at that, and we think of that, what Christ was doing here on earth with his blood makes more sense. Christ was born in the flesh, John 1.14. The word became flesh because and for the purpose of 
shedding his life, his blood, upon the tree on Calvary, on the place of the skull. He came through this life to shed his blood and to bring spiritual life in doing so. Remember what Jesus taught there in John chapter 6, 53 and 54, in light of what God had explained concerning the blood and life. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now this statement caused many of the disciples to run away from Jesus. Their whole life, don't eat the blood, don't drink the blood, life is in the blood. But what Jesus was trying to explain to them was not the physical blood here, but the spiritual application. He was life. And unless we partook of him, we could have no life. Life is in the blood. In his blood in particular. In Matthew 26, 27, 28. He explained this idea further, didn't he? And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. When we look at this idea of blameless and how we can be blameless in this life, knowing who we are, our shortcomings, our failures. Jesus came to this earth and said, listen, I know because I created you. I know your failures. I know everyone's shortcomings. I've come here to give you life through my sacrifice. When we partook of the Lord's Supper just a moment ago, it was to remember that sacrifice. Each week we are reminded again of the body that was beaten and the blood that was shed for our sakes, for our life. Christ's blood brought about the new covenant. In Hebrews 13 and verse 20, the Hebrew writer would say it this way, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Christ's blood brought about the new law, the eternal covenant for Jew and Gentile. Christ's blood not only brought this new law, as I said, it brought the forgiveness of sins. Paul, in Acts 22 and 16, And now why are you waiting, Ananias said to him? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Christ's blood not only brought the new covenant, not only washes away our sins, but paid for us or redeemed us from sin to righteousness. In Galatians 4, 4 through 5, but the fullness, or excuse me, when the fullness of time had come, that perfect moment God had prepared from Genesis uh, 3 to the time of Christ, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. What does the word blessed mean? Or excuse me, what does the word blameless mean? <coughs> blameless means knowing and understanding 
that the blood of Christ is life eternal. Knowing all of that helps us understand then how we are blessed by being blameless. And it's because Christ has blessed us in himself. When we obeyed the gospel, <clears throat> when we studied the word and we put our belief and then our faith in Christ, when we confess him as Lord and Savior and repent of all our sins, and we are baptized as we saw there, to have our sins washed away, when we obey the gospel, our sins are washed away. We're pure. We're clean. There is zero sin in our lives. And that's because the power that's in the blood of Christ. But as we talked about earlier, we still can sin. Galatians 6, 1 and 2, you who are spiritual, restore those. There's no need for restoration if you can't sin. As we saw 1 John, or as I mentioned, 1 John 1, 8 and 10, listen, we call God a liar if, as Christians, we say we do not sin. That's why we need the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 and following. Listen, we sin even after we've obeyed the gospel. But the beauty of the blood of Christ is that it wasn't and isn't just for when we obey the gospel and have our sins washed away. When we obey his plan of salvation, that being God's. The beauty is that that blood continues to wash away our sins. In 1 John 1 and verse 7, remember again what it says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Notice this. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. King James cleanseth, meaning it continually, in the present tense, nonstop, continually cleanses us from all sin. Now, verse 9 makes it clear we've got to repent and confess when we sin to be cleaned by it. But it is always there for you and I. There is only one way to get into heaven. And it's scary to think about. Jesus declared it. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, he said, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's only one way to get into heaven, and that is to be perfect. To be blameless. Remember that word blameless means perfect, undefiled, no sin. Remember Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin, singular, is death. The only way to get into heaven is to be perfect. Yet you and I know we're not. I've used it before. I'll use it again. When I asked Brother Perry Cotham at 92, 93, do you still sin? After preaching 70 plus years at that time, I think 72, 73 at that time, he said, not as much as you, but yes. Not as much as I did at your age, but I still do. I still need the blood of Christ. I still need his forgiveness. We can't be perfect, and we won't be perfect. In our life, we're going to make mistakes every day, even if we are in the Word as Brother Perry Cotham for all those years, we're going to mess up. We're going to miss the mark. It ought to be less each and every day and each and every year as we strive to be perfect, but we're going to struggle. But the good thing about our God and the reason we can be blessed is because Christ has made that avenue by which we can get to heaven by being blameless in this life. He sacrificed his 
self. He gave up so much, that being Christ, God the Son, to come to this earth to shed his blood for our forgiveness of sins, to make us blameless. Is there any greater joy or blessing than knowing God has washed our sins away? That even when we mess up, we can go to him after we've obeyed the gospel and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And bear fruit of repentance and he will forgive us. It will be, as he said, remembered no more. The perfect blood of Christ can make you and I perfect. Not of our own accord, but of God's. So how do we, God's children, who have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation, how do we, having become blameless through obeying the gospel, stay blameless? As I said, John, 1 John 1, 7 talks about walking in that light, receiving the blood of Christ. How do we make sure we stay blameless, undefiled, or perfect in the blood of Christ? We do this as the psalmist said there in Psalm 119, 1 and 2, but 2 in particular, by walking in the law of the Lord. That means we are blessed when we are blameless by keeping the law. When we keep God's statutes, his statutes, his law, as both Psalm 119, 1 and 2 detect, walk in his law, keep his statutes, when we do that, we give ourselves the opportunity of staying in the blood of Christ, free from sin and blessed by Almighty. Again, let's look at Psalm 119, 1 and 2. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. <laughs> Who seek him with their whole heart. It is vital that you and I, to receive the blessing of knowing we are blameless, it is vital that we understand we must seek God through his word. In John 14 and verse 21, Jesus would say it this way. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be beloved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said it this way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Just saying I want to be blessed and I want to be blameless isn't enough. We must do the will of the Father. We must follow God. John, the apostle of love, 1 John 2, 4 through 5. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. How? How do we know we're blameless? How do we know we're walking with God? We're keeping his word. We know we're following it, not by emotion, but by diligence, by study and recognition. Jesus again in John 8, 51, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Why? Because he or she will be blameless. Our great mediator, our lawyer, Jesus Christ, in other words, through his blood and his mediation, 
will keep us blessed and blameless. But we must keep God's word. But there is more to keeping God's word than just simply doing what it says. We must keep it also with a whole heart. As Psalm 119 verse 2 there said, we must, in other words, seek him wholeheartedly or with a whole heart. Throughout the scriptures, God points to those who walked according to his will, who kept his word, the law, but not with the whole heart. We talked about this before, 2 Chronicles 25 and verse 2, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He kept his will. He did what was said, yet not with a whole heart. Isaiah 29 and 13. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. That's interesting. The fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Over and over, God says we are to fear him. The idea, Ecclesiastes 12 we are to sum up the whole matter, fear God, keep his commandments. What does he mean? They've just simply said we are to fear him. He says not with a the heart. They're saying it. They're even doing it, many of them. But not with the heart. We see a congregation like that in Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 3. The angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves an apostles and are not, and found them to be false. They knew God's law. They knew who taught right and who didn't teach right. They knew what it said. They were even condemning following Righteousness in this case. I know you are endearing patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Verse 4, but I have this against you. You left your first love. Your whole heart isn't into it. It's important that we keep the law of Christ. We have to. We can't get to heaven without it. If we're not obedient to Christ and his word, which we will be judged by, John 12, 48, we will not get to heaven. But if our heart isn't into it, our whole heart, not half heart, our whole heart, then we won't get to heaven either. In Luke 10, verse 27, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus doesn't get more plain than that. We must obey him with our all, but all our heart has to be in it as well. In Matthew 19, 16 and following, the rich man, he had obeyed the law of God. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teach you what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he, that's Jesus, said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, the rich man said to Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? He had kept the law of God. He had followed them. Jesus even admits to the fact, listen, he's done it. Notice this. 
Verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you would go, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This man lacked one thing. His whole heart into it. He understood the law. He even followed it to a T. But he forgot the part that goes with it. His love for God in the process. Blessed are those who keep God's law with a whole heart. Who do what God expects and do it because they love him. The blood of Christ, which flowed backwards and then forward to you and I today, and his willingness on our behalf to go before the Father, to confess us to him, and to mediate on our behalf, which means to be our lawyer on behalf of us towards the Father. That's what allows you and I to be blameless. Do we deserve that moniker, that title, that idea by our own actions? No. Because we're without sin? No. Do we deserve it because of the blood of Christ? Yes. Christ loves you so much. That he was willing to give up everything in heaven for a time. So you and I could be there forever. When Adam and Eve sinned, God set forth in motion, Genesis 3.15, the scheme of redemption or the plan of redemption to bring us, redeem us back to the fold. And he worked all that time. To bring about that fullness of time so Christ would come at the perfect moment for you and I. So that we in this life could go through this life with the challenges and the difficulties, the trials and the tribulations. So we could go through this life blessed, joyful, happy. Are there challenges? Are there difficulties? Are there things that we wish we didn't have to go through? Sure. Sure. But blessed are those whose way is blameless because they have the blood of Christ continually. As I said, this doesn't mean we will not sin. But it means with our whole heart we seek his commandments, repent when necessary, and give our life to God. Blessed are those whose way is blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. As we examine and think about that in our lives, have you been blessed knowing you're blameless? As I said, that word blameless, it's hard for me to fathom. It's hard for me to hold on to. But when I think about it more and more, when I think about what God is saying, God loves me and he loves you so much that he's not wanting us to be burdened by our weaknesses. He knows we're weak in many areas. What he wants us to focus on is correcting those weaknesses, but loving him in doing so. God has said to us, I will take care of you. I promise you heaven. If in your weakness, you come to him and allow him to bless you in your life. That begins by obeying the gospel. By obeying God's plan of salvation. There's a lot of plans of salvation out there, aren't there? 
You can go down any book aisle or digital book aisle today and see thousands of books on how to get to heaven and they'll all say something different. The unfortunate thing is, is many of them leave out aspects of what God expects. Most people understand and recognize they got to get into God's word. But as we said this morning in class, that's changing some. How many times I've read or even come across those who would say, listen, even if you've never studied the word, even if you've never have talked or learned about Jesus, just raise your hand and be saved. Put your faith in him and he will save you. I gave the illustration the one time about the guy who was in a wreck and he was dying and the paramedic came up to him. The paramedic said to him, listen, do you have Jesus in your life? He said, no. He said, listen, if you want Jesus in your life, accept Jesus and you'll go to heaven. That's a lie. You can't have faith in Jesus without studying his word. In Romans 10, 17, it says this, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You can't have faith. Belief and trust, that's faith in Jesus. You can't have it without study. It doesn't work. In fact, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't do it at all. So we have to get into the Word to even have faith, to believe in Him and trust in Him. We then have to, according to the Scriptures, repent. Jesus died because of our sin. Because Romans 3.23, every single one of us have sinned and are deserving of death. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. This is that time Christ came that all may repent and come unto him. And if we confess, there's something beautiful said. If we confess our Lord, notice what Jesus says in Matthew 10.32. Whoever confesses me before him, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, our advocate. When we know who Jesus is through studying the word, and we believe and trust in him, and we see what he's done for us, and we're willing to give ourselves completely over to him in repentance saying I'm done with that life the word repentance doesn't mean I'm sorry it means I'm done with sin I'm done with a life away from Christ and when we make that great confession Jesus says listen I'm going to go to the father on your behalf but belief leads to trust which is faith and that faith when we repent leads to faithfulness and we must be willing then to complete the act of the plan of salvation or the gospel. We must obey the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 1 8, we read this in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God. And notice this on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. I heard a guy one time say, What is the gospel? And it was amazing how many people gave a thousand different answers. And yes, the gospel is mentioned many a different way in one sense, but they all revert back to the original. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where Paul would say this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, even to this day, meaning have been saved and continue to be saved. You hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was then raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1, hey, you have to obey. How do you obey a historical event? How do we obey something in the last, that was 2,000 and plus years ago? Paul in Romans 6, 3 through 5 would tell us how, wouldn't he? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, death, 
buried. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, nor that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. When we obey the gospel, culminating in that submission to Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection of baptism, and we walk that faithful walk, we keep his commandments wholeheartedly, God has said, listen, that blood which washed away your sins will continually cleanse your sins. And God says, you and everyone else who does it will go to heaven. This morning, if you haven't obeyed this, get with somebody and study this. Don't take my word. Don't take their word. Open up the Bible and see what God says. That's what saves us. If this morning there's someone here who's obeyed this, but they're not feeling blessed in recognition of the blamelessness God offers them, I understand you can make that correction. But it takes you wanting to. And the prodigal son, the son had to come back to the father. If you are not feeling blessed, happy, joyful in your life, because you know you're not blameless in the blood of Christ, Make that correction now. And let this family here wrap our arms around you, strengthen you, and encourage you until that time when either Christ comes back or reach that glory with him in our death. So this morning, if there's someone here who would like to be blessed in the life of God and needs this family's prayers in doing so, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.